Woodward has a really interesting story because he was in danger of going to law school after being in the Navy, and he can tell you the rest. So I was 27, I was going to go to law school, and then I did a simple calculation. So uh, I law school three years, uh, so I'd be age 30 when I got out of law school. And as you know, that's the end of life. <laughs> and so I tried to get a job at the Post. I had a two-week tryout, which I failed. Uh, they pointed out uh, that I had the opposite problem that Carl had, and that is I was not a good writer. And um, I worked at a weekly newspaper in the suburbs of Washington for a year, and then they hired me uh, back at the Post because I had some stories at the weekly paper that they wished they'd had. He was a pretty good reporter when he started. Yeah. <laughs> and then, should we tell him how, because, how we started working together? Because that was uh, yeah. an yeah, accident you, you, you of start, nature. You start to tell. Yeah, yeah. And, the, <laughs> and I'd been at the Post nine months, and they had this strange And burglary. the management really loved him, which the rest of us resented. <laughs> I was the lowest paid reporter uh, at the Post, and uh, I, I really loved it. And uh, I think Carl would agree with this about journalism. As he was saying, you go to press conferences, you go uh, talk to people, you see real life, you get to make these momentary entries into people's lives when they're interesting and then get the hell out <laughs> when they cease to be interesting. And if you're a doctor, you know, it may be a whole day or week of routine. Uh, if you're a lawyer, you know, you may look at, oh, at my appointments. Torts. Today. You got yeah. to get through torts. Yeah. Okay. And you, it, it can be boring. But uh, I never have found an editor at the Washington Post or anywhere else where they will say to you, okay, let's go find a story that's routine and boring. Mm -hmm. It necessarily is, and this is the energy of journalism, I think. It's what's going on, what don't we know, what does it mean, what is the impact on people's lives. And it's wonderful to have that sort of job. And so uh, the Watergate burglary, and uh, it was a glorious day. June 17th, 1972. A Saturday. And the editors looked around and said, oh, it's so nice out. Who would be dumb enough to come in and work today? And my name immediately came <laughs> to, their, uh, to the top of the list. And so they sent me to the courthouse where the five burglars were arraigned, charged. They had been arrested the previous night uh, at the Watergate wearing rubber gloves, business suits, and carrying sequential $100 bills. Yes, <laughs> right. And I, I, though only doing night police for nine months, I had never seen a burglar in a business suit. And so there they were in court, and uh, the, I'm sitting in the front row, and the judge asked them, where, where do you work? And the lead burglar, James McCord, uh, said, uh, I didn't want to really answer, well, where did you work, the judge asked. And McCord went, CIA. And the judge said, speak up. And McCord went, CIA. And then the judge said, no, say it so we can hear it. And he went, CIA. And I finally heard it in the front row and went, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> Burglars in business suits. Uh, a kind of formality, CIA connection. So and another one had said when asked his occupation, anti-communist. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. That's right. Exactly. So then you... Then I was in the newsroom that day, and it's, it's interesting that we should be telling this tale today because I was one of two of the Washington Post chief Virginia reporters at the time. And that meant that I lived in Richmond, uh, during the legislative session, and this week is the end of the legislative session in Richmond where they're having trouble, as you know. Uh, the governor, lieutenant governor, 
uh, and now the Attorney General. And uh, I thought this was a dream job. I loved being the Chief Virginia Correspondent because I got to travel all over Virginia, which is a fabulous, wonderful state with this remarkable, conflicted history, which in its way is a, the history of America. And uh, as well as um, wonderful people. And I was in the office. I had come in from Richmond uh, to write a profile about a man running for governor. And I could see this activity around the city desk. Uh, I was on what was called the state desk, Maryland and Virginia. And uh, I went up to the desk to find out what all the commotion was about. And I heard about this uh, event at the Watergate the burglar is being arrested. And I said, well, this sounds like a better story than the one I'm working on for the weekend. <laughs> and uh, so I told the city editor, uh, and I, I was pretty good at knowing how to use telephones by that time. I'd been in the business. Uh, it's, by that point, I'd been in the business for 12 years. And, uh, and I said, I'll make some calls. And I kind of nodded his ascent and uh, I started making calls to the families of the burglars, what were called in the, the names of the burglars, and uh, down in Florida and I called some waiters and other people at the Watergate restaurant um, and then later uh, Woodward came back from the courthouse and, uh, and a story was put together that you tell the rest. Well, no, let's, we're going to actually let somebody else right. ask a question. Because okay. we, 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 That's we have right. become right. insufferably long-winded. That's right. And we'll give That's you a right. whole That's right. biography. That's right. So let's. Yeah. Uh, He's yeah. right. But how many of y'all have seen the movie of All the President's Men? Well, then you, you get a pretty good feel for it in there. So this is different, but um, do you think that you, you think are? Social, oh, I'm Amanda. Hi, man. <laughs> do you think social media has turned pe people's back on mass media? Do you think social media has turned people's back on mass media? Go ahead, Robert. Do you <laughs> think that social media has turned people's backs on mass media? Um, yes, somewhat. I mean, the internet is uh, impatience and speed, right? Summarize, give it uh, to me and answer questions that can't be answered right away. And the, so, I mean, what we found uh, in working on the Watergate story, we had uh, bless them editors who said, take your time, go see people. Carl developed the uh, system, which is, is, is central uh, to what we did, of going to people's homes at night, knocking on the doors when there's, you don't have an appointment. And part of that was because Carl, even then, was a renegade, and no one wanted to see him in their office. <laughs> No, but it's it, it, people are comfortable in their own home, and you found the bookkeeper and the treasurer, and that that was the central, and so it demanded patience. And it, I've often thought if there was social media at that time, we would have not been tweeting out, "Oh, gee, went to the Nixon committee treasurer last night." We would be keeping it and trying to find out more and discover what it meant. Hi, my name is Imani Wilson. Um, so I just wanted to know, um, I'm familiar with you too, so I just wanted to know what is your, like, your favorite or the most, um, the article that you're most proud of? Hmm. Uh, in my case, I would say two. Uh, one is a story that Bob and I did together on October 10th, 1972, which was the sum of everything. The Watergate burglary didn't make a lot of sense as an isolated incident. And through some tips and following out, knocking on doors and seeing people, 
we were able to establish that the Watergate burglary was just one element of a massive campaign of political espionage and sabotage that had been directed by those closest to the President of the United States. And I, I would put that as the, the biggest story. And in my case, I think the other story, uh, and I read it, oh, a year or so ago, is uh, I spent about six months doing a, a story for the Washington Post uh, when I was a local reporter uh, about a, a fascinating group of people uh, called the We Sorts who lived in Southern Maryland. Uh, and the name came from We Sorts of People are different than You Sorts of People. And they're a group of people who were technically known as tri-racial isolates. And you did this story. I did this year? story. I did this story probably in 71 or 70. Before and, Watergate. Uh, and part white, part African-American, part American Indian. And they had evolved over the years. And there are probably half a million tri-racial isolates in different communities, very insular in the United States. And this group in Maryland is particularly notable because it was possible for me to really find out their history going back to their many of their indentiture uh, during the colonial period and afterwards and slavery uh, because Maryland was a Catholic colony and so there were parish records. So I was able to take all the skills that I really had learned in journalism and apply them to, to this tale of this group of people who had persevered, had horrible problems in their own community, and, and uh, I've just always loved the story. And then I got Hi, my name is Levi. I was wondering if you think there's any correlation between this presidency and Nixon's. <laughs> easier, Over to you. <laughs> easier to describe the creation of the universe. Uh, there obviously is some similarity, there are investigations, there are lots of questions, there are uh, so many lies in, uh, there were in the Watergate-Nixon case and there are in the Trump case, but uh, when Carl and I lived the Nixon case and we, we did lots of stories, there were lots of allegations, and the key to unraveling the story and showing precisely what happened and the extent of Nixon's criminality uh, was the revelation and the actual presentation of the secret Nixon tapes. Thousands of hours of Nixon just committing crime after crime after crime. In the case of Trump, we do not yet have that kind of evidence, quite frankly. There are lots of things that point to it. Uh, Mueller's investigation is going on very, very intensely. He is the special prosecutor investigating Trump and the Russian connection and anything uh, that comes with it. I recently was looking at uh, interviews I did with Mueller when he was FBI director after the 9-11 terrorist attacks, when you were, you know, four or five, maybe not even born. And uh, one of the things Mueller said, which struck me, he said when he's working on a, now he's director of the FBI, when they're working on a case, he likes to make sure that you understand the substance and the texture of what's going on and that you burrow in to the point that you find the people literally who have day-to-day -day responsibility in the organization uh, for what you were investigating. So this in part explains the sprawling nature of his investigation. He's looking at everything. Uh, somebody who worked very closely with Mueller uh, for years uh, said to me, I, I, you know, what's Mueller like? Because he's a shadowy figure. He doesn't give press conferences. He doesn't, he's very secretive about what they're doing. So what's he like? He said, well, if you rip the mattress tag off, 
and Mueller finds out, he will prosecute you. <laughs> and some people call him Bobby Mueller, the mattress tag prosecutor. I, I remember in fourth grade looking at that mattress tag and saying, you know, if you pull this yeah, off. So you'd be elect you go to the electric chair. <laughs> at least. I thought, wow, one rip, and it's a life of, of crime. And uh, so he he's looking at it in a very comprehensive, secretive way. Don't know the answers. Uh, I think it's really hard to, and it's going to turn on the quality of information that's presented. And if Michael Cohen, who was Trump's personal lawyer for 10 years, has tapes, I think that and those tapes really show what Trump was doing. That will be critical to the investigation. But Okay, I'm going to see if I can. Oh, thank you. Hi. <clears throat> Excuse me. My name's Charlie. I was, uh, I was pretty young when all that Watergate was being unraveled. And if I can kind of go back to that, I think I want to put this more as a, an observation. And you can tell me whether you, know, you agree with my assessment on this. But uh, I think you left it off where you know, the, the way that whole thing started was with these burglars in suits. And uh, when uh, asked their occupation, the one said CIA. It was almost like this puzzle that you couldn't ignore. You, you, you had to dig deeper. It was just, it presented itself and it needed to be investigated. And, and I think another factor at that time, we were kind of uh, in a state of, um, I think there was a lot more disillusion of the younger generation at that time, as opposed to there was a generation gap. The older generation was saying, you know, never question your government, you know, that's disrespectful. And the younger generation was questioning everything from civil rights and our involvement in Vietnam. And so I think there was a, that was definitely a factor. Did you feel like uh, you, you, you kind of were, you, you knew you were doing, you were onto something big and, and that the public was behind you, or at least uh, the younger generation might have been behind you in revealing uh, a wrongdoing uh, no. as, it, as it opened up. <laughs> no, am I, I getting mean, too, you, am I, I rambling you, too much? It, it, it's, uh, <laughs> the, the public wasn't behind that's, us. That's, that's why I said no. Yeah. It, it, and, it, and, just uh, the opposite. But, and, it, but, but as, it, as, it, as it revealed itself, did you feel but that? But it took a long time. And when, after we did our major stories, <clears throat> Nixon won a landslide re-election in November 1972. And uh, the key to, I mean, you, you said, well, it had to be investigated. Yeah, I mean, you uh, couldn't ignore it. <clears throat> it. It didn't have to be right. investigated. We had editors who turned us loose who would say, okay, what about Watergate? Go work on it. Go knock on doors at night. And uh, without that kind of support system, you don't investigate it. And it turned out no one else did. And the conventional wisdom, and I, I don't really think it was a generational break, no. it, but the conventional wisdom was Nixon's too smart to do something like this. And even if he did, you will never find out. It will be concealed and covered up. Of course, it was concealed and covered up, but because we had uh, a sense, we, we could work, I mean, the, apropos of the question over here about the internet, we could work two or three weeks on one story, write uh, a draft on six-ply paper and you, any of you remember what typewriters were? <laughs> and then give copies to all the editors. They would ask questions. We would ask questions, more sources, more detail, and then publish now in the environment. Carl does work for CNN. I still uh, work at The Post, and... Uh, you have something that looks like a minor advance on a story, and someone will say, can we get it on the air in an hour? Or, at the or less. Or less, or the Washington Post, can we get it on the website by noon, right away? And so the hydraulic pressure 
in the system on the editors, producers, and reporters is speed, be first, not really take the time to dig in. Well, my name is Paul, and my question is, um, even decades after his resignation, a lot of people still um, idolize Richard Nixon. Why do you think that is? Why do you think people still look at him and think he was a good president, even after you say all these criminal charges have come out and he resigned? I don't, I don't think that, I think there are some who believe that. Uh, I don't, you know, I'm not a great believer in, in polls and their absolutism or anything like it, but I think that polls show that it's a, it's a rather small percentage of people who believe that. I think there are fanatical uh, Nixon cultists, lovers, uh, whatever. Uh, also, um, we live in a time but where um, it's very hard for historical fact to hold. There is so much questioning and back to the earlier things about social media, there's stuff on social media about supposed conspiracies that happened back then that didn't happen. Uh, but nonetheless, I think Nixon's reputation for what he did is, is pretty secure, uh, both in the history books and among most people. And, and real quickly, uh, after Nixon resigned, Barry Goldwater, the Republican senator from Arizona who was the conscience of the Republican Party, had Carl and myself up to his apartment in Washington, and he read from his personal diary. And he read from an entry August 7th, 1974, uh, as Watergate was ending and Nixon had Goldwater and the Republican leaders to the White House. And uh, Nixon knew he was going to be impeached and charged in the House. And so he asked Goldwater, uh, he said, uh, so Barry, uh, how many votes do I have in the Senate? Now under the Constitution, it would take 34 votes to keep Nixon in office would need 67 to remove him. And so Nixon kind of said in an offhanded way, so what do I have, just 20 votes? And Goldwater looked at him and said, Mr. President, I counted the Republicans, and you have four votes, and one of them is not mine. <laughs> and the next day, Nixon announced he was resigning. It was the Republican That's Party right. and their judgment on Nixon that led to his resignation. And I, I think also given the extent of the tapes and the clarity of what's on there and the closure of Nixon voluntarily resigning uh, means that uh, his, his reputation is pretty well sealed. Hi, my name's uh, Thomas. Um, I was wondering if you thought that there was a way we could stop the spread of misinformation or clickbait while still upholding the First Amendment. What's, I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry. The, the, what, the, 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 you want to repeat it again about clickbait and its relationship to the First Amendment? It's how, how you phrased it? You got, you use the mic? You got the mic there? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's Trump saying that the news is fake news and that the press is enemy of the people. And I, I mean, it, it's uh, on one level uh, outrageous that he says that. But as Carl has pointed out, it's the old Nixon strategy during Watergate in the early 70s, what Nixon did. Uh, and somewhat skillfully for a while is say, oh, the real issue here is the conduct of the news media, not the conduct of the president. And Trump, uh, as is his way, has amped up that strategy uh, in a way where it's almost continuous. And uh, I think the one of the offshoots of this is people in the press, particularly on cable news both ways, have become 
very emotional about Trump, either against him or for him. And uh, I think the more factual and empirical and the cooler we can be about this, uh, the better. But a certain percentage of the people are buying the Trump attack. I don't think I, it, it's a majority by any means. And so what's the remedy for us to make our work better, more factual, uh, less emotional, and so it doesn't appear to be partisan. Hi, my name is Nikki. Um, don't, going back to fake news, um, how do you think that like things being labeled as fake news affects the ability to report what's going on around the world? Okay, I, I don't think it should have that much impact. But can, can, if, if you'll indulge me for a moment, I'd like to ask everyone there a question. And that is, where do you get information if you're doing a paper or if you're working for the newspaper here? Tell, raise your hand, somebody tell me where you get information. Search online. Pardon? Search online. Search online, Google, okay. So you've got online books, documents, the written record. Where else do you get information? Pardon? Okay, but the, those would be documents, uh, presumably. Where else? Journals? Okay, where else? Where else? Where how many, in, in line, one question, how many people here have worked for a school newspaper? Okay. Where else do you get information here? Facebook. Facebook, okay. Where else? Ah, human sources, right? Human sources are really, I think, the backbone of reporting, finding witnesses. And so you've got human beings, human sources, documents, the Internet, and so forth. Where else do you get information? Surveys. Surveys, okay, that's kind of information. Let me tell you a story that answers it, if you'll allow me. I, in the first months I worked at the Post before uh, Watergate, I found somebody in the health department in the District of Columbia who would give me the sanitation inspection reports of the restaurants in Washington. And uh, it was a sensational series of articles uh, because the more expensive the restaurant was, almost inevitably, the worse the sanitation conditions were. He was the rat droppings reporter. Right? <laughs> it's it's true. Yes, it's, it's true. true. I'm and really good we, at it. If, and if, if we could find <laughs> a report that said there were rat droppings in the restaurant, that got people's attention. And so one uh, morning, the human source in the health department called me and said, I've got the document, the worst sanitation inspection ever given. And so I went and got it, and it was the Mayflower Coffee Shop. Had a score of 50, and I will, because we're gonna all have to eat later today, I won't <laughs> tell you what they found. And I uh, showed it to the city editor, and he said, oh, that's a great story, front page story, Madison, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the uh, Mayflower Coffee Shop, the Mayflower Hotel, famous in Washington on Connecticut Avenue. Said, so write it up and we can have this story done early. So I wrote it up and handed it to him. And he said, have you been there? And I said, no. And he said, well, um, it's two and a half blocks away, get your ass out of the chair and go there. And I kind of thought, picky, picky, right? So I went down to the Mayflower Hotel and said, where's the coffee shop? We don't have one. And you don't, you don't have one. Well, we have a buffet and a famous French restaurant. And I was kind of, hmm, what's going on here? So I looked at the address of the Mayflower Coffee Shop, 
and it turned out it was in the Statler Hilton Hotel, which was half a block from the post. And so I went there, and it was closed for repairs, they said, found the manager who said, oh yeah, well, we had a bad inspection report, got some response from him, and went back to the city editor and said, can I have my copy back? I have a few small changes <laughs> I would like to make. And so I corrected uh, that it was the Mayflower Coffee Shop in the Statler Hilton Hotel, not in the Mayflower Hotel, and um, stuck with me the lesson there. What's the lesson? And what's, how does that relate to where else you get information? Personal experience. Go to the scene. See it. When I'm doing books on uh, presidents from uh, any of them, including uh, Trump, I will get somebody in the White House to take me to the Situation Room, which is uh, what's called the SCIF Special Compartmented Information Facility. You're supposed to have a top secret clearance, but somebody will take you in there. And I want to see how big the chairs are, what the ambience is, how big the screens, where the screens are placed, uh, where the president sits, where the other cabinet officers sit. Go to the scene. So I think and that there is not a story you will ever do. There is not a paper you will do for high school, college, anywhere, where you are not going to get information from all three tracks. Human sources, some sort of documentation, some, some sort of going to the scene or personal observation, no matter what it is. And so when you're doing a paper, think, where, how can I expand my experience base to cover all, at least all of those areas and hopefully multiple people, multiple documents and actually visiting what you're writing about. I think we have time for one final question. Hi, my name is Julie. Um, I was wondering what you think, um, well, what is the role of educational institutions in terms of teaching political knowledge? I'm thinking. <laughs> Well, I would hope, and it's just off the top of my head, that uh, educational institutions would, in addition to the predictable sources of books, information in books, that there would be an examination of contemporaneous media back to what Bob is talking about, to, to, to see what the New York Times is saying about a particular political situation or how it's reporting on larger cultural questions that, uh, in which politics figure, how television is looking at it, uh, how news and and history as it's being recorded and written figures in the process in addition to second generation, for instance, uh, history written by people who may not have been alive for, uh, to, to observe what they're writing about. I'd like to, I'd like to see more, and I, and I say this having, having taught like Bob, uh, taught a little bit at, at the college level. Um, I think we need more that is out of the traditional academic uh, realm. Yeah, um, just real quickly, I think it, it also is uh, training and exposure to a way of thinking. Mm -hmm. And That's there good. is a way of thinking that can help you in whatever you do with the rest of your lives, and it can help you immensely here, and that is that 
people will say, oh, this is the way it is. This is absolute. And uh, it's not. And if you can get in, I mean, Graham, Graham Greene, the great novelist, uh, said uh, at one point, he said, uh, uh, do not despise your enemies or people who disagree with you. They have a case. And what he was saying was, you're not necessarily the people who disagree with you or people who are your enemies that you're going to agree, but understand they have a case. There's a basis for their thinking and their conclusions. And part of, I think, a central feature of a college education is to make sure you are as sure as you are what something is. See what the other side is saying. Try to get in their head. It will it will always help you. And just to, uh, to go back to yeah. the, the Watergate story <clears throat> for us, we had experienced, you know, the top political reporters uh, at the Washington Post just telling us, no, this, Nixon didn't do this. You're never going to find out what I was saying. And they were wrong. And so you have to always be in a frame of mind. This is the information I've got. This is the conclusion I've got. But is there a case on the other side? And make sure you understand well, that. One other really good thing that Bob's saying here is, and if you look at the Watergate reporting, uh, none of our sources, certainly none of our major sources, were Democrats. They were... They, they, they really were all people who were Republicans or worked within the Nixon uh, administration or campaign. And, yeah. and the source it, Deep Throat, Mark Feld, was the number two in the FBI. That's right. This is a man who was a dedicated Hooverite, J. Edgar Hoover, thought Hoover was on the right track and was so for multiple reasons, offended by what was going on in the Nixon White House, so offended that he did not get the FBI directorship that he was willing to help us. And so that, when Carl first went to the bookkeeper, and it's in All the President's Men, and it's in the movie version very vividly, it's you're not going in and saying, gee, I know the answers. All I know is you were the bookkeeper and you kept the records of all of this cash that was in a slush fund. Where did it go? And then leading to the key question, who authorized the expenditures of hundreds of thousands of dollars for dirty tricks, espionage, and sabotage. And so the, the path is not to walk in with, ah, I know the That's answers. Right. Have you ever done a story where you it turned out the way you initially thought it might? I, have, I can't think of one that really has. To, and it's always different than it, your well, even, preconceived notion that's and gone even, through your I head. And as you've always said, you know, just get those preconceived notions out of your That's head. That's right. Don't walk in. I mean, you always uh, said, and I think this is vital, beware, be suspicious of true believers yeah. on one side or the other, the political side, or if it's not about politics, people who say, now, I mean, here, what's the story in the New York Times? The big astronomer at Harvard now thinks there's life out there. It's a fascinating story. Right? Do you think he's right? I don't know. <laughs> I do. 